Prophet Messiah Garfi, who still lives spiritually with us and is here today, to welcome in the most sacred fashion the bear that this honorable gentleman spoke about, his son in his own flesh, Marcus Messiah Garvey. Oh, wow. Thank you. Now, all the microphones are way down here, and I am going to be up here, so I don't know how you're going to deal with that situation. But as the volume should be get rather strong, I don't think you will have too much difficulty. I'm very glad to be here. I'm very glad to have been invited to be here by African Echoes. And this is the first time I'm speaking in New Jersey uh, since I moved here. The last time I spoke was at the Newark uh, Museum in 1985. And that was a very well attended meeting. There were over 900 people there. So it does seem that Newark has an interest in African nationalism, has an interest in blackness, and that's a very good thing. This evening, I'm going to talk about the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey and their applicability to present times. This is the year of the centennial. It's a hundred years since the birth of Marcus Mosiah Garvey on August the 17th, 1887. There have been many celebrations this year and I've been fortunate to be a part of several of those celebrations in the United States and in the United Kingdom. And I have been moved by the positive feeling among people for Garveyite activity at this time and in this place and in every place all over the world. The message that you will get this evening is not a message about a man and a mission that are long past. It is going to be a statement. And when I'm finished, I'm certain you're going to agree with me, that the African world, the African race, needs Garveyism more than ever now and that it is time that we, as black people throughout the world, set about completing the unfinished tasks of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. This evening, I will divide my lecture into three parts. First, I will deal with Marcus Gunn and the environment that produced such a man. Then, I will discuss the message of that man. Then I will show the applicability to our time and what Garveyism would mean in our time, nationally here in the United States and internationally. Marcus Garvey was born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica, in a small country town in a small country. He was one of 11 children, 11 children, of whom only two survived to adulthood. That indicates to you the harsh conditions, first of all, under which African people lived in the times of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. For Jamaica was not unique in harsh conditions for African people. That norm for the African throughout the world. Marcus Garvey grew up in this town and he had his primary and basic education in this town. And in 1903, he went to Kingston to be an artist as a printer to his godfather, Mr. Burroughs. He very soon became engaged in trade union activities. And he took part in the formation of the first trade union in the island of Jamaica. 
He was continuously agitated for the rights of the workers, although he was a foreman, and he was dismissed from his job. By 1910, Marcus Garvey, who was then years old, was publishing his own paper, The Watchman, in Jamaica. As he agitated, he became a target for the colonial authorities in Jamaica. It became difficult for him to get a job in Jamaica. That is one of the facts about living in all Caribbean islands. There are many small Caribbean islands that the power structure is able to deny you a means of livelihood very readily. He went to South and South America during the period 1910 to 1912. This is important what he went through. He went first to Costa Rica, then to Panama, to Nicaragua, and to Ecuador. In each of these places, he worked and he carefully studied the conditions of black people. <coughs> now, he worked on the bus for the United Fruit Company, and he worked in the tobacco fields of Ecuador, to so tobacco plantations. In Costa Rica, again, published a newspaper, La Nacional, and in the Panama Canal, he published another newspaper called La Prensa. At this age, remember, Marcus Garvey is 1925. He has already been in, in three newspapers. And in each of them, he's articulating the sad conditions of black people as he saw them. He returned to Jamaica in 1912 and went on to England, a very important period of his life, where he worked and he studied at Berkeley Park College. <coughs> And he worked on the African Times and Orient Review, which was a nationalist publication published by the African and Egyptian nationalist scholar, Dus Muhammad Ali. Marcus Garvey wrote articles for that newspaper. Now, in contact with Dus Muhammad Ali, he's coming in contact with a man on who understood the mainstream of African, early African culture. Now, he's in London where he can research and investigate the history of peoples, even although it is distorted by the white man. So it was a very fertile proving ground for Marcus Garvey to develop his thoughts. Now, on his way back from England, he got the idea of creating the Universal Improvement Association. And this was formed in Jamaica in 19... And it by that time had become the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community League. Marcus Garvey worked the UNI and ACL in Jamaica. Once again, frustrated in Jamaica. Jamaica is a frustrating country with a majority, an overwhelming and ma majority of African people, but who have been so thoroughly brainwashed by the European master and his associates that they find it extremely difficult to come to terms with African nationalism, which for so many black people in the world comes almost naturally. I suppose it depends on how often you get a kick in the ass. <laughs> if you get it off, you will realize your intrinsic blackness and that no power can make you and the alien one. Marcus Garvey was invited to the USA by Booker T. Washington because he wanted to develop a similar uh, in, in Jamaica as Booker T. had done at Tuskegee. <clears throat> when he reached in 16, Booker T. Washington was dead, and the rest is history, which is readily accessible, and which I don't want to talk about today. We know that Marcus Garvey developed the mass movement. We're going to talk about the mass movement today. We're going to deal principally with philosophy. But that was the beginning. 
the street corners of Harlem, he moved to build a mighty organization which uh, existed in more than 34 countries with a membership of well over 4 million, a membership estimated, a membership, not followers, not sympathizers, but a membership estimated up to a total of 11 million. The greatest mass movement of African people that the world has ever seen. Now, let us just mention certain other factors that form the thinking of Marcus Garvey before I start to discuss the philosophy of Marcus Garvey. Slavery was abolished in the United States in 1864. So that when Marcus Garvey came to the United States in 1816, we are looking at a period of 52 years from slavery. But slavery was abolished in the Spanish-speaking colonies in 1886, the year before Marcus Garvey was born. And slavery was abolished in Brazil in 1888. So at the time of 1916, the last black man was just 28 years out of slavery. The Congress of Berlin in 1885 the white man had sat down and parceled out Africa as if he was slicing a cake. Even little Belgium got the massive Belgian Congo. At the time that Marcus Garvey started his great work here in the United States, lynching of black people was a common practice of the Aryan barbarians of the United States. At the same time, Leopold, the king of the Belgians, was cutting off the hands and other parts of Africans in the Congo because they would not work fast enough on his rubber plantations. This was the norm, these were the norms of that period, a brutal period in the history of the world, which saw the imperialist greed of the white man at its highest. It was this that Marcus Garvey saw, the cruel conditions of African people throughout the world. The almost magical domination of the Aryan white man in all parts of the world. That made him say, I look for the black man's kings. I look for the black man's men of great affairs. I look for our armies and our navies. I could not find them, so I set out to make them. In the process of making power for black people, Marcus Garvey created an organization. Now, the guiding light of that organization, theory behind that organization, is the concept of the philosophy of Marcus Garvey. And the philosophy of Marcus Garvey is not merely Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad, although that is one of his very famous statements. The philosophy of Marcus Garvey is a complete set of philosophy for black people <coughs> which is contained in the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey and in the other writings of Marcus Messiah Garvey. That philosophy is called universal African nationalism. And that is what I am, is going to be the main topic of this lecture. You have never seen any white man anywhere in the world talk about universal African nationalism. Because the white man believes that the black man cannot create his own ideology, and that the black man is incapable of building his own nations. Now you will say to me that the black man has nations all over the world now. But I say to you that each of those national boundaries that we have was set by our white slave master and not by us, with the possible exception of Ethiopia. There is not one African country in the world whose national boundaries was specifically marked out by African people. The only reason why I stand before you today and call myself a Jamaican 
is because the slave ships dropped me off in Jamaica. Or rather dropped my ancestors off in Jamaica. Whereas the slave ships brought you here, your ancestors here, to the United States. That is why I am a Jamaican and you're an American. Now, just as I leave Jamaica and come over here and become American, who made me an American now that I'm an American citizen? It wasn't an African that did that. It's an American white man who says I'm now an American. So all these national uh, boundaries that have been delimited for us have been delimited by people of another race who have decided who we are. And if they are not Aryans, then they are Arabs. Because they will have people in the north of Africa who are black as midnight and tell you that they are an Arab. Right. Now, how did they become an Arab? They became an Arab because some conquering Arab gave them the religion of Islam, just as my slave ancestors were given the religion of Christianity, and told them that they were part of that Arab nation. That's why they are now calling themselves Arabs. <laughs> you have some people who go around and say that they are Israelites and Jews. But you're going to soon find out who we really are, because that is part, a principal part of my message. Now let us look at the first concept <coughs> of universal African nationalism, the philosophy of Marcus Garvey. The first concept is African identity that all so-called black people share a common history, heritage, ethnicity, and culture in the sense of the roots from which they sprung are and are essentially and integrally a part of the African nation. That is the definition of African identity. That is the definition of who we are that was given to us by Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Now, why did Marcus Mosiah Garvey give us this? Remember the words of Franz Fanon. Those who define are the masters. Once the African black man starts to define his nationality, his ethnicity, his history, his culture for himself, in that action, he throws down the gauntlet to his slave master and says, I am not your slave any longer as Patrice Lumumba said to the king of the Belgians, right. we are not your monkeys. <laughs> what that means is we will not long any longer dance to your tune, slave master. We are Africans, whether we are inside Africa <laughs> or whether we are any other place in the diaspora. We are not Africans by permission of anybody inside Africa. We are Africans by right of heritage and ethnicity. <laughs> If we look back at recorded history, we will find that man, the black man has lived in Africa from the beginning of time. Because when man came out of his primeval darkness, as we will go to very soon to describe, to define for you, he came out of his primeval darkness in Africa. That was where the first man was created. Now, how he was created, that's not for me to discuss. There are many stories of the creation, and I will to them here. But what I'm saying, if we look at all the generations of life in Africa, man has been in Africa now, developing from Homo sapiens for something of the order of one million years. How many generations are those? Can we say that because we have lived these few generations in the Western world, that we are now suddenly transformed into things called Negroes, coloreds, and blacks. That defies logic. And whatever defies logic is completely and absolutely untrue. 
These nationalities that we have have been given to us by alien peoples. In fact, in many cases, they didn't even want to give us a nationality because we were not considered full men. We were considered possessions. They have had to have amendments to the Constitution here in the United States to make the black man and the black woman a person. Up until the end of slavery, whether in the Caribbean, in South America, Central America, or, the, or North America, the black man, the black woman was a chattel, was a thing, not a person. How could the chattel have any nationality? So now we have acquired a nationality. And we say, as African nationalists, that is our prescriptive right to define our nationality. And we define our nationality in such a way that is to work in the interests of the African people. African identity means that all black people, or so-called black people, everywhere in the world belong to the same African nation. All black men are brothers. We are brothers and sisters because we share a common heritage and a common descent. The second concept of Garveyism is African pride. Pride in our glorious history, pride in our descent, pride in our intrinsic worth as people, and pride in the knowledge that we, the Africans, built the first civilizations that were known to man. The evidence shows that original man was first established in Africa. That the first man originated in the area, area of Kenya, Tanzania, where Dr. Louis Leakey in 1959 found fossil skulls dating to approximately 2 million BC, the first clear indication of the existence of Homo sapiens on the face of planet Earth. The supporting evidence is clear that the black man, the African, came down the Nile from his source of origin in the, this area, area of on the boundary of Kenya and Tanzania to create the great civilizations of Egypt called Kemet, Nubia and Kush. That by around the year 10,000 BC, the Africans in Nubia and in Egypt had created an ordered agriculture and had formed there the most progressive areas in the world. At this time, the entire rest of the world included, I mean, I don't even talk about the Aryan white man, for he was a, a howling savage. He was the last person to achieve a civil civilization, and that is a fact of history. But even the fabled Chinaman was playing with his sheep on the Gobi Desert, and the so-called long-established civilization of the, of the Indian, and I talk now about the East Indian, the man who in Jamaica we call the Coolie Man, he who, that proud Brahmin who goes around claiming that he's superior to all other peoples, just like the proud Han chauvinists of China. And I want to emphasize this, that there's not only white people who are racially arrogant in the world, because we now look around us and see these people coming into the United States. Yes, they are coming here and exhibiting their arrogance. Chinese, Koreans, Hindus, arrogant people. But these arrogant people were late comers on the road to civilization. Now the facts that I'm quoting here are not, some of the facts that I'm quoting here are not only from black scholars, but they are from white scholars. Dr. Louis Leakey was a white man. <coughs> the 
have tried very hard to make him recant his fines or rediscover some other fines because that is the nature of the white man. That is the nature of all these arrogant racists. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting story about an arrogant racist. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte. After his troops had been thoroughly flogged in Haiti, his brother, Lee Clerk, husband of his sister Pauline, had been defeated in Haiti by Toussaint L'Overture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Henri Christophe, the greatest achievement of the black race in modern times. <laughs> 100,000 Frenchmen dead. And I may as well tell you that the British tried afterwards to regain Haiti for the white race and over 100,000 too, although that is not well documented in history. But the, all the brothers who have been to London and gone into the files over there have found out that Britain suffered one of the greatest defeats that the British army has suffered in hundreds of years, right in Haiti. The Spanish came and they were flogged too, right in Haiti. And the Americans tried to get in as always to rule the country and they were beaten. As a matter of fact, America was very afraid that Toussaint L'Overture was coming across to North and South Carolina to free the slaves and to set the South with fire because Toussaint had a massive army of slave warriors who had just defeated the finest armies of Europe. That was what the situation was in 1804. So the white man ran like anything with him and made peace and signed treaties. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was telling you about this arrogant Frenchman, Napoleon, who suddenly when he invaded Egypt, after his defeats of his troops, came face to face with the Sphinx. And when he looked at the thick lips and broad nose of the Sphinx, he said, my God, these gilded Africans, that's what he called them, they were the people who created civilization. And he ordered his gunners to blow off the face of the Sphinx, but they could only get the nose. If you go to see pictures of the Sphinx to this day, you see where the gunners of Napoleon defaced, or they rather um, smashed the face of the Sphinx. I am very happy, and I'm certain you all are, that the Sphinx made Napoleon so unhappy. <laughs> African pride means black self-respect and black self-worth. It means that you are here to a heritage which did not end in ancient times, after the white invaders pushed south. Because we still created great empires all over Africa. Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Zimbabwe, which the white man claims when he saw the magnificent ruins of Zimbabwe were built by some creatures from outer space. He couldn't believe that an African black man could have created so far south all these magnificent edifices these mighty cities. You see the strange mindset of the white man, unable to accept to himself that the African, the same African who created civilization in Egypt, is the same African who moved all over Africa, creating all these great cultures. And what we did in the past, we can do again. As Marcus Garvey said, up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. African pride means that the black man must know himself. He must know his history. He must know where he is coming from in order to know where he has arrived at and then to find his directions for the future in order to know where he's going to. African pride means that the black man is satisfied with himself as a black man. That he does not want to fornicate, adulterate, and miscegenate with the woman of another race 
in order to change his color or complexion in the next generation. That's right. And I need now to refer you to the words of Marcus Garvey, what we believe from page 81 of volume two of the Philosophy and Opinions. And here we have the teacher expressing the essentials of African pride. The Universal Negro Improvement Association advocates the uniting and blending of all Negroes into one strong, healthy race. It is against miscegenation and race suicide. It believes that the Negro race is as good as any other and therefore should be as proud of itself as others are. It believes in the purity of the Negro race and the purity of the white race. It is against rich blacks marrying poor whites. It is against rich or poor whites taking advantage of Negro women. I will now refer you to page 19, volume 2 of the Philosophy and Opinions. And that is headed, Negroes Robbed of Their History. The white world has always tried to rob and discredit us of our history. <laughs> they tell us that Tutankhamen, a king of Egypt, who reigned about the year 1350 BC, was not a Negro, that the ancient civilization of Egypt and the pharaohs was not of our race. But that does not make the truth unreal. Every student of history of impartial mind knows that the Negro ranch ruled the world when white men were savages and barbarians living in caves. That thousands of Negro professors at that time taught in the universities in Alexandria, then the seat of learning. That ancient Egypt gave the world civilization and that Greece and Rome have robbed Egypt of our arts and letters and taken all the credits to themselves. It is not surprising, however, that white men should resort to every means to keep Negroes in ignorance of their history. It would be a great shock to their pride to admit to the world today that 3,000 years ago, black men excelled in government and were the founders and teachers of art, science, and literature. The power and sway we once held pass away but now in the 20th century, we are about to see a return of it in the rebuilding of Africa. Yes, a new civilization, a new culture shall spring up from among our people and the Nile shall once more flow through the land of science, of art and of literature, wherein will live black men of the highest learning and the highest accomplishments. One of the great moments for me in my study of Latin, when I went to school in the old time days in Jamaica, we studied Latin, was to meet this phrase, Ex Africa, Semper Aliquid Novi, written by the great Roman historian. What that means, something new is always coming out of Africa. Yet the white man, with all this evidence laying down in front of him, says, we were a race of barbarians and came out of the trees until he enslaved us and taught us culture and civilization. <laughs> what a first class liar. <laughs> the third concept of Af universal African nationalism is African self-reliance. That black institutions under black leadership working to achieve black power of every kind are a necessary requirement for the survival of our race. The black man cannot achieve salvation for himself. The black woman cannot find her way to the new Jerusalem under white leadership, yellow leadership, or brown leadership. We must have our own distinct and separate institutions that are led and directed by ourselves and which must be expressly created to solve our problems in our ways. <laughs> Black institutions that are for the salvation of the African race cannot be financed 
by the grants of aliens. Those who pay the piper will certainly call the tune. The essential need for us is this, to work within our closed institutions. To formulate policies within our closed institutions. To execute those policies for our own benefit and advantage. If the white man, the brown one or the yellow man is in there in our institutions participating with us, we will quarrel, fight, and wrangle till the end of time, and our progress will always be the same. Two steps forward and six backward. <laughs> My view of African national institutions are this, is this, clear and straight. There must be a wall past which they cannot see. There must be a door to which they have no key. Every nation, after our defeats in North Africa, and I don't want to go into the history of that, that's because that's not the primary lesson, but every nation in Africa that kept the white man out of his borders survived until some succeeding king admitted them in, and immediately there was disaster and ruin. As long as the great Queen Nzinga lived in the Congo, the white man was kept out. And as soon as she left and they changed their policies, they were a defeated African people. <laughs> African self-reliance means that we must be prepared to work for the betterment of our race, ourselves. And the objective which we must have is the acquisition of power. That's why Marcus Garvey is known as the first black power man. Now let us understand what Marcus Garvey said about power. Volume 1 of the Philosophy and Opinions, page 21. Power is the only argument that satisfies man. Except the individual, the race, or the nation has power that is exclusive it means that that individual race or nation will be bound by the will of the other who possesses this great qualification. It is the physical and pugilistic power of Harry Wills that makes white men afraid to fight him. It was the industrial and scientific power of the Teutonic race that kept it for years as dictator of the economic and scientific policies of Europe. It is the naval and political power of Great Britain that keeps her mistress of the sea. It is the commercial and financial power of the United States of America that makes her the greatest banker in the world. Hence, it is advisable for the Negro to get power of every kind. Power in education, science, industry, politics, and higher government. That kind of power that will stand out signally so that other races and nations can see, and if they will not see, then feed. Man is not satisfied or moved by prayers or petitions, but every man is moved by that authority which forces him to do even against his will. And let us understand what African self-reliance means. That we must be prepared to exercise some element of force to persuade our enemies and enslavers that we are in earnest about the business of African liberation. On page 16 of volume 1, Marcus Mosiah Garvey says, The powers opposed to Negro progress will not be influenced in the slightest by mere verbal protests on our part. They realize only too well that protests of this kind contain nothing but the breath expended in making them. They also realize that their success in enslaving and dominating the darker portion of humanity was due solely to the element of force employed. In the majority of cases, this was accomplished by force of arms. Pressure, of course, may assert, assert itself in other forms. But in the last analysis, whatever influence is brought to bear against the powers opposed to Negro progress must contain the element of force. 
in order to accomplish its purpose, since it is apparent that this is the only element they recognize. The fourth concept of Garveyism is African ownership. The wealth of the African community must be in the hands of African people. African ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange is mandatory. A race or a people will survive when they control their own economies. <coughs> Marcus Garvey created in 1919 the Negro Factories Corporation for putting into effect this concept of African ownership. He created grocery stores, laundries, clothing factories, restaurants, and printing plants. And many of these uh, enterprises failed, and they failed because at the time you'll find out <coughs> The people who were working in them were bribed and, uh, to destroy them. There was a concerted attack. Now, you might think this is far-fetched, but I remember speaking to an old Jamaican brother about why he never returned to Jamaica. And he eventually told me why. He said he had a bakery on the north side of the island. And a Chinaman wanted to take over his bakery. He was running a rival bakery, the Chinaman. Now, this times were the times in the 1920s, early 1920s, in Jamaica. His foreman was bribed by the Chinaman, and he uh, sabotaged the door in the machinery. Now, if you know anything about bakery, when they, whatever they put in that door to sabotage it, the whole machinery is wrecked. And to get that machinery to work again would be a colossal effort. To replace machinery in the 1920s in Jamaica would mean importation of that machinery from the United States that would be a matter of several months. So the business of this African brother was wrecked by an African traitor. And the Chinaman was now the sole supplier of bread in the whole of that area on the north of Jamaica. Now what is interesting is that the African traitor went to the Chinaman now after he had done his work and after he had been paid off to get a job. And the Chinese man look at him and say, Hey, nigger, you think I fool? <laughs> if you do that to your own black brother, what do you think you would do to me? Get your black ass out of here. <laughs> the black people who sabotage the different enterprises of Marcus Garvey, I wonder what happened to them. Because, you know, after those enterprises closed down, where did they work? It's a good question. What happens to the traitor who takes money from the white man to destroy his own race after he has carried out his task? Does he use that money wisely and build anything? Of course not. He's a traitor, so he has no wisdom. <laughs> Marcus Garvey also created for us the Black Star Line in 1919. Now, contrary to what you may be told, the Black Star Line was not to carry black people back home to Africa. It may eventually have grown to that, but it was created for the specific purpose of trading between the west coast of Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States of America. The object was to link the three principal 
black communities of the world at that time. West Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States. It was very interesting for me when I went to England to look, read the newspaper and see that one of those Hindus is now got funds from whites or fellow Indians to have a shipping line and he's considered a genius to trade between Africa, the Caribbean and the United States of America and he's going to trade with black people and he's considered a genius for what he's going to do to help black people. Strange world, isn't it? The fifth concept of Garveyism is African unity nationally and internationally. I know no national boundary where the Negro is concerned. The whole world is my province until Africa is free. <coughs> Marcus Garvey set about fulfilling this concept of African unity by building the massive UNIA. As he said in page 11 of volume 1, the greatest enemy used against the Negro is disorganization. The solution to the problems of our race lie in African unity. And African unity means organize, organize, organize. What does African unity mean? Perhaps it's... Look at it from the point of view of other people, what they mean by their unity. One of the most profound statements I've ever read was that by a Jew who said, if you cut a Jew anywhere in the world, I bleed. Now that is Jewish unity. If we were united at that level throughout the world, there is no force or power in the world that could oppress us. Let me give you an indication of what this unity does to African people. Many of you did not realize that the French people are among the most vicious colonialist people in the world. At this very moment, the French <coughs> are key colonial subordination, colonial and imperial enslavement different peoples of Martinique, Guadeloupe, and Cayenne, so-called French Guyana. In August, five members of the Guadeloupian freedom movement, the independence movement for a free Guadeloupe, escaped from Guadeloupe in a plane their names were Mounien, René, Fabre, Bernard, and Marechal. They went first to the island of St. Vincent, a black nation in the Caribbean, supposedly independent. And the Prime Minister, Mitchell, they were fleeing from the French. They were just one step ahead of the French. Refused them the right to remain in St. Vincent. They went on to Guyana, and again in that black African country of Guyana, the head of government, Desmond Hoyt, and the rest of the government of Guyana refused them permission to remain in Guyana. They now went to Suriname, where the leader is a gentleman by the name of Butersi, and he refused them asylum also, three African black countries in the Caribbean. But not only did he refuse the asylum, he called the French authorities and told them that they had come to Suriname. So when they left Suriname and had no place else to go but to go back to St. Vincent because they were going low on fuel, they were now locked in by the French radar system in that area. And you have to understand when you're dealing with the white man, 
It is doesn't matter whether he speaks French or English or what. Because each of these people work together. See? Now they are locked to the French radar system. And they are head back to St. Vincent. And what does Mr. Mitchell do? He says, okay, let's talk. You can stay for a while, let's talk. Let me see what I can do for you. So he holds them at the airport in St. Vincent while he's supposedly talking to them. But he isn't talking to them. He is now sent to the French and told the French that they're there and that they must come and get them. And the French land in airplanes. And when he knows the French have arrived, he pushes them out of the airport building at gunpoint into the waiting hands of the French white men who then take them back to Guadeloupe. When the people of Guadeloupe start writing, they are taken to France. And as far as I am aware, I have not got <coughs> information from the brethren who gave me this story. They are still in the dungeons of France. <coughs> now that is a story of African treachery. Now it makes you understand how we all got here, didn't you? <laughs> Because the white man just couldn't have come to Africa and grabbed us and brought us over here if we were united as African people. When he came to Africa, we would have wiped him out. He would have got his, you know what, right out of there. And you've got to think about this. Why are we here in New Jersey this evening? Because a people called the Red Indians failed to unite. They remain Sioux. Pawnee, Cherokee, Blackfeet, Navajo. They never, never realized that they were all Red Indians when it came to dealing with an alien who was invading. So they lost an entire continent. And don't follow the usual Aryan story that they were a bunch of savages. Because, you know, they said we were a bunch of black savages. Now, who built the great civilizations of the Incas and the Aztecs? The Red Indians, of course. So how come they were savages when you want to and take their land? The essential lesson, brothers and sisters, is a lesson taught to us by Marcus Garvey. Only African unity can preserve African life. We will disappear as a people unless we come together to deal with our enemies. And we are surrounded with our enemies. The sixth concept of Garveyism is that we must have a great central nation in Africa. Our African superpower that will be of defending African people in every part of the world. Page 31 of volume 2, I quote again from there, page 81, sorry. He's saying, what we believe, the UNIA believes in the social and political, physical separation of all peoples to the extent that they promote their own ideals and civilization with the privilege of trading and doing business with each other. It believes in the promotion of a strong and powerful Negro nation in Africa. Now, Marcus Mosiah Garvey was not the first great nationalist from this. The celebrated African nationalist Edward Wilmot Blyden, in his to the descendants of Africa in America, expressed the this was in 1860. Need some African power, great center of the race, where our physical, pecuniary, and intellectual strength may be collected. We need part friends may go forth in behalf of the race, as shall be felt by the nations. We are now so scattered and divided that we can do nothing. The imposition begun last year by a foreign power upon Haiti, and which is still persisted in fills every black man who has heard of it with indignation. But we are not strong enough to speak out effectually for that land. 
When the same power attempted an outrage upon the Liberians, there was no African power strong enough to interpose. So long as we remain thus divided, we may expect impositions. So long as we live simply by the sufferance of the nations, we must expect to be subject to their caprices. Marcus Garvey tells us in 1924, we need a great nation in Africa. In 1862, Edward Wilmot Blyden told us that. Now Marcus Garvey Jr. is saying the same thing in 1987. How long are we going to take to realize that just as the Jew found out that he needed a homeland of his own, the African must realize that he needs a homeland of his own. Do you think that anybody can kick a Chinese around in this country? You're crazy. There are 1,000 million Chinese over there. They're right there in the United Nations. You can't beat upon somebody because he's a Chinese. You can't beat upon people because they're Indians, because they have a government that has atomic weapons. India and China have atomic weapons, yes. What do Africans have? A Saturday night special, a Uzi, made by somebody else. That's what you have. That's your best weapons, huh? Yet the Chinese man is putting up his artificial satellites. He has his rockets. He can travel 1,600, 2,000, 2,500 miles. The Indians are getting to work building them too. They have their weapons. No black people. We need a great central nation in Africa. Let us look what the great teacher told us. Page 16 of volume one. I think this is volume two, page 16. I think I've got my, bear with me, I have got my quotations mixed up here, but I can sort them out. Two, Marcus Garvey, in the true so solution of the Negro problem, stated his views uh, very concisely here. He said, we cannot allow a continuation of these crimes against our race. As 400 million men, women, and children worthy of the existence given us by the divine creator, we are determined to solve our own problem right, by redeeming our motherland Africa from the hands of alien exploiters and found there a government, a nation of our own. Strong enough to lend protection to the members of our race scattered all over the world and to compel the respect of the nations and races of the earth. Do they lynch Englishmen, Frenchmen, Germans or Japanese? No. And why? Because people are represented by great governments mighty nations and empires strongly organized. Yes, and every reddish ready to shed the last drop of blood and spend the last penny in the national tre treasury to protect the honor and integrity of a citizen outraged anywhere. You can talk till doomsday in America. Unless you have some strong external power to protect you, you will still be subject to the whim and caprice of this ruling master race here. And this is becoming a serious problem than ever before in the United States. 
Why? Because 50, 60 years ago, you could say that the white man was prejudiced and ignorant. That we had just come out of slavery. That there may have been some excuse for his barbarous behavior. Me. Operative word, me. But when, in this day and age, a Bernard Getz can get up and just gun down black people. When young whites will attack black people simply for coming into their area. Not to do something hostile, but simply to eat food. I don't need to tell you of all the different things that may have happened to you individually in this country, because they have happened to me. I spent eight years in Massachusetts. And believe me, I would not make any mistake about traveling certain areas of Boston after the night came down, because there'd be no guarantee that I'd come out in one piece. Those Boston Irish and Boston Italians are extremely fierce. And they don't like anything black. What I'm saying to you, black brothers and sisters, it is very essential to have a great nation in Africa. Not only for the emotional thing that it gives, might give us, to know that black people are strong in other parts of the world, but for our own intrinsic security. Now, this is what the Jew found after he lost six million under Hitler. I say to you in all seriousness tonight that the black people in the United States did not achieve and have not achieved the level of integration that the Jew had in Germany. And as for our black middle class who seem to think they have achieved the American dream, let us remind them when the German middle class Jews were warned that this man Hitler was coming and what he might do to them. They said, no, no, it cannot happen in the land of Goethe. It cannot happen in the land of Hegel. This is a civilized country. I've heard the same argument from American blacks. It couldn't happen here. <laughs> the king can always change. The president can always change. His advisors change. We must look to the lessons of history. Who are the people that we are dealing with? The same blood kin of Adolf Hitler. The English, the French, the Germans, they're all Aryans. Have you ever heard about the massacre of the Huguenots? The Huguenots were white. They were living in France, but they had a different religion and they were prosperous. So being prosperous is one of the things that make a majority hate you. When they are not prosperous, when hard times come, they blame you for everything. So that middle class psychology that I have made it, <laughs> there'll be those who will want to take it away from you. They massacred the Huguenots in France in the 16th century. In three days, the saying ran red with blood. White men killing white men. Because of some imagined religious grievance. The Armenians were in Turkey. They were members of the Turkish parliament. We got black congressmen, right? But when the Turks became aggrieved by their defeats, in the First World War, in a matter of three weeks, they wiped out a million Armenians. And those who were members of the British, of the Turkish parliament, they declared that, them, that they were traitors and subversives, removed their parliamentary immunity and hung them, strung them up just the same. What man has done before, man can do again. And remember all these people we're talking about, you know, whether it's the Huguenots or the Armenians or the Jews in Germany, they all look like the people who they were living among. <laughs> now we are different from people. We have no, we have them Africa up on us. All of you look at me and I look at you. 
We got Africa marked up on us. So how are we going to escape from this man when he gets wild in here and directs his ire against us? We must have a big brother out there to protect us. And that's what Marcus Garvey said. And there is good reason for it. Marcus Garvey us that we must apply science and technology to race building. <laughs> At page 14 of volume 1 of the Philosophy and Opinions, Marcus Garvey says, the battles of the future, whether they be physical or mental, will be fought on scientific lines. And the race that is able to produce the highest scientific development is the race that will ultimately rule. In his great statement of African race policy called African fundamentalism. He says, God and nature first made us what we are. And then out of our own creative genius, we make ourselves what we want to be. Follow always that great law. Let the sky and God be our limit and eternity our measurement. There is no height to which we cannot climb by using the active intelligence of our own minds. Mind creates, and as much as we desire in nature, we can have through the creation of our own mind. Being at present the scientifically weaker race, you shall treat others only as they treat you, but in your homes and everywhere possible, you must teach the higher development of science to your children and be sure to develop a race of sciences par excellence, for in science and religion lie our only hope to withstand the evil designs of modern materialism. We live in the age of the robot, the artificial satellite, the nuclear bomb. Those did not exist in Marcus Garvey's time, but the great prophet and teacher foresaw for us the need to apply ourselves to the scientific method. This is the seventh concept of Garveyism, and it is essential now, although we are starting late to follow the teacher, to make this move. You think of all the black brothers around the place who spend so many hours developing the skill of throwing a ball through a hoop. If they had spent an equal amount of time with their books, they would become masters of algebra and trigonometry. There is no doubt about that. One of the fallacies that we are taught is that certain racial groups have m basic mathematical skills. Until you associate with all these racial groups, as I did in the Caribbean, and had the chance of testing my skills against theirs, Jew, Arab, Hindu, Chinaman, Aryan, you find out that they work all very hard. Well, they won't tell you that. You have to find it out. The reason why you develop skills in mathematics is the same reason why you're very good at throwing a ball through a hoop from 20 feet out, because you work at it. Everything takes practice, and practice makes perfect. Finally, the image of God. For some people, the most controversial of all Garvey philosophies. When the prophet said, God is black, all the priests and preachers around the place raise up their hand and says, what blasphemy? But let us read what the great prophet and teacher said to us about the image of God. Page 44 of volume one. If the white man has the idea of a white God, let him worship his God as he desires. If the yellow man's God is of his race, let him worship his God as he sees fit. We as Negroes have found a new ideal. Whilst our God has no color, it is human to see everything through one's own spectacles. And since the white people have seen their God through white spectacles, we have only now started out, late though it be, to see our God through our own spectacles. The God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Let him exist for the race that believes in the God of Isaac 
and the God of Jacob. We Negroes believe in the God of Ethiopia, the everlasting God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, the one God of all ages. That is the God in whom we believe, we do what we shall worship him through the spectacles of Ethiopia. Marcus Garvey said to the black people of the 1920s, take down the pictures of the white Jesus from your walls and replace them with a black divinity. That was a Garveyite injunction. Together with the late great Archbishop Maguire, he formed the African Orthodox Church, the Church of the Black Christ and the Black Madonna, so that black people could worship in a church with correct and appropriate black imagery. It is amazing to this day to go to church after church and still see the white Jesus and the white God. But <laughs> so it is, brothers and sisters. So it is. But I tell you something, a state of mind is a very hard thing to lose. I went to a friend of mine from Jamaica's house, you see, and um, she is a black Israelite. But this Israelite still has the white Jesus up at our wall. Now that I found really hard to believe. If you're a black Israelite, and they have a separate congregation from the white Israelites, then why do you have a white Jesus on your wall? First, you're an Israelite. That's when you're black. So what is he doing up on your wall? But we are a strange contradiction. Now, I've given you the eight basic principles of universal African nationalism. Now, don't look at your watch. I don't, don't, I'm not finished with you yet. I'm just getting to the meat of the things now. Having shown you what Marcus Garvey stood for, I'm going to deal now with the application of universal African nationalism today. And I'll do it in two parts. I will talk nationally, that is, what affects us here in the United States as African Americans. I notice that, I say African Americans, because the minute you leave whatever island in the Caribbean, you come over here, my thesis and the thesis of Marcus Garvey is that you are become an African American when you're here. Because we know no national boundary where a Negro is concerned. We say now, we don't use the word Negro anymore. We don't, we know no enough, we know more than was known in the times of Marcus Garvey. We said, well, who were the African Communities League? That was the Africans. How are you going to have a League of African Communities if you're not dealing with African people? So we say we are Africans, and people are getting more and more accustomed to the term. But African nationality means that we're all one nation. Therefore, if we are in America, we are African Americans. When we go to Jamaica, we are African Jamaicans. When we go to Ghana, we are African Ghanaians. Or we're just plain Ghanaians because we are now in Africa. So that is our concept. The first problem in the United States that confronts us, not maybe from the point of degree, but certainly the one that we have to deal with most, is unemployment and underemployment. Now, the statistics show us that 40% approximately of young black men under the age of 25 are unemployed. That is a horrendous statistic. 18% of black men totally, in respect of age group, are unemployed. That's another horrendous statistic. Now we say that we would apply to that the principles of self-reliance and African ownership. It is not for us to expect that the government of this country, the government of this country is going to provide jobs for all black people or even a significant portion of black people. The only time that the government of the United States of America ensured that all blacks were employed was during slavery. There was full employment. <laughs> there is nothing in the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of any country in the world that says that everybody must have a job. So it's not a constitutional or prescriptive right. Self-reliance, how do you do that? First, by mobilizing yourself, of course, within your own institutions. 
and developing your own employment. Our problem is that we have allowed all these chains, all these aliens to come into our communities. When we had the whole time black mom and pop stores, we had much more employment because who was mom and who was pop? Our people. And who they're going to employ? Us. I live in Tine. And I go into the supermarket that I am. No, they have quite a few black people in there. But the majority of the people working in there are not Africans. And certainly the people who are running the place, they are not Africans. See the problem? Now, why, how would we deal with this from a concept Garvey had prompted of, of self-reliance? Then what did Marcus Garvey do? He created an organization, and that organization would run. They didn't have supermarkets in those days, but they ran grocery stores, large grocery stores. So that is what we should do. We should organize collectively. And this has been done in other parts of the world. You see, black, why is it that it's so difficult for black people to open a supermarket or anywhere? Because we do not have access to credit like other races. A Korea, an India, an era will come over here and find access to credit. He can't even speak English properly, you know. But he will get access to credit. But when you're black, you don't get access to credit. And this is one of the strange things too. Because if you go to the Caribbean, which are black countries, black people in those countries don't have access to credit to the same extent as the, the Indian or the Chinese or the Arabs or the Jews. This is interesting. <laughs> Barbados had a black prime minister called Tom Adams. As a matter of fact, I know him well. We studied together in England. And Tom was always a reactionary. Now, Barbados never had any Indians in Barbados. One of the few countries, because when the Barbadians, uh, after slavery, you know, Indians and Chinese came to the Caribbean because the Africans refused to work on the plantations after slavery. But in Barbados, they did work the plantations for a while. So they, weren't, they didn't bring in any, and Barbados was a much smaller island, so they didn't bring in any Indians or Chinese. Now, Tom Adams brought in Indians after Idi Amin kicked all of them out of Uganda and brought them into Barbados. Because he said, now he's a black man, said that black people don't know how to run business. So he's bringing Indians in there to run the business. Now, there's a great furor in Barbados about these Indians because not only that, they have taken over all the businesses all over the place and are bringing more and more Indians into the country. And now all of a sudden, Africans are suddenly realizing that they are faced with a menace, a Hindu menace. <laughs> you know, leadership is a strange thing, isn't it? We have black leaders and we have black leaders. But we have black leaders who are only superficially black. But when you look inside of them, they're as white as chalk. Their minds are incorrect because their actions are detrimental to the interests of their race. And that is the difference. You may find leaders of other races that you can bribe, but when it comes to doing something to harm their race, they ain't going to do it. It is a black man that is so unique when it comes to that. I'm saying that unemployment depends self-reliance African ownership. We must be able to mobilize within our organizations and have collective ownership. We can't do it individually. In other key areas where we can do it individually, then we must be prepared to go out and steer the brothers into the right place. Yes, sir. Now, don't tell me it's against the law. There are many things that may not be strictly legal, but it's our communities and we must take charge of them. What we're saying is that if you know a brother is black brother is over there giving a good service, then you shouldn't be allowing other black people to walk past that brother and, and get the same service from an alien. The objective must be to squeeze them right back out. Right back out. These people come in here in the day, pick up all our money, 
And at 6 o'clock, they clear out. And their money is gone to finance enterprises and other things and to be sent home to Arabia where not they come from. Now this is a serious situation. Because it's not even as if a black brother come over here from Jamaica and make it over here because at least a sister over here can hope that well she can marry the brother and you know she can share the wealth too. But these aliens, there is no way of reaching them. Because what they have, they hold, and they ain't going to share with us. But they sure as hell like to drain it away from us. Garvey principles tell us how to deal with this thing. This is our problem, how to attack. The next thing is the prison population. This is a, an extremely serious situation for black people. Thirty-three percent of the people in the jails of America are black men. Of the male population in the jails of America are black. Now, with whatever stretch of the imagination, um, you cannot say that there's more than 11 percent blacks in the total population of the United States. Now, any time you have a statistical imbalance of the order of three to one, then that must in itself be evidence of prejudice. These brothers didn't just get here by because of criminal propensity. Now the way to deal with this thing is African identity and national unity. By national unity I mean organizational unity. Always we use the term national unity or international, it means that we must be organi organizationally uh, sound all through the nation. We must bring black people together. If we have massive organizations that are working in the interest of black people, then we will protect these people. They go to jail because they don't even have legal advice. Now, this is not only an American problem. Black people throughout the world do not get legal advice. I remember before I left Jamaica, a judge suddenly found 50 young black brothers in jail in Jamaica for which no offense could be found. So he started, you know, somebody came up before him and he said, what is the charge? He said, we had no charge because somebody must have made a mistake and brought the brother out. Then he said, well, let us find out if there are more in here. And when he finished searching, there were 50 of them there. Again, and they had been in jail for months in a black country. But those poor black people that are sweep up off the streets there, they don't have nobody to represent them. Their family cannot afford a lawyer. So you see, the, proper, the situation that we have here is compounded because we are not organized. Nobody can sweep up a poor Jew from anywhere if there are, if there are poor Jews in the United States and stick him in jail. <laughs> and stick him in jail and he get lost. There is always some Jewish organization that is out here working for him. No, don't tell me about all the middle class black organizations here because they don't want to touch poor people and I'm coming to that one. <laughs> what we're saying that Garveyism teaches us, I am my brother's keeper. Very important. Now we have an example from recent times when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the Nation of Islam, when the Nation of Islam was the Nation of Islam before the departure of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I want to remind you, for those of you who don't know, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was originally Elijah Poole of the Detroit Division of the UNIA, and he was a member of the African Legion. The, the Muslims were able to take brothers out to jail to work on those brothers and see to it that they didn't go back into jail. <coughs> What we need are not <coughs> religious organizations confined to Islam or Christianity, but Garveyite organizations which embrace all religions, which are nationalist organizations working to reclaim African people everywhere. There is no such thing as a brother who is permanently lost. I may not have been here today. <coughs> Once I was in England and I was walking past a certain bar in England. And all of a sudden some white men came out of some cars, pushed me against the wall and run right through my thing. And they said, you're clean, you can go. <laughs> but suppose one of them had stuck something on me. And he didn't say I was clean. He said, we're dirty, we found this on you. How would I ever be proved to the world 
I would have had a conviction for what? For nothing. Black people are always suspicious to white people. This has nothing to do with the United States. You go to England, it's exactly the same. People are just looking at you. Oh yes, you go to Canada too. Yeah. You travel anywhere and see if it's different. The minute you see that black face, everybody gets suspicious. Now, nothing is going to change that attitude in the foreseeable future. And we have to react to this. Don't tell me that all, that such an alarming proportion of our black youth are criminals. That is crap. They are made criminals by the system within which we are operating. That's right. That's right, right. Now, everybody steal and everybody do his things, white people and all that. But not with a three to one imbalance. Our job as African people to deal with this problem. Why is it a problem? Because young black men who are in prison can't help their families. Black women who are outside without their men, what is their future with their children and no men? There is a high mortality rate associated with this same problem. Because when you come out back from prison, it's one hell of a thing to go and get a job. Especially when you have no help. So that it is a situation not only of working with the brethren to see that they don't get into prison, but of helping them after they come out and of helping them to find a place in society. And this should be the duty of our organizations, following the ideology of Marcus Garvey. Now the next great problem that faces black people here is drugs. Drugs that are in our communities in a massive flow. Now, cocaine and heroin and all those things are made somewhere. Then they are transported to the United States. Now, there is no evidence anywhere that black people are making these things or bringing them in here. What we do is we push them when we get here. Now, it is for black people working together within their organizations and also teaching our people the correct mental approach that what African pride means that you don't take noxious substance. It's not a teaching process. And of course, we also have to have some form of enforcing. If you want to clean up your community, then you have to wield a big stick too. That is part of it. You see? Now, why is it that you're not going to be able to walk around and push drugs openly in an Italian area? Hmm? <laughs> Something might happen to you. Try to do it, eh? Hmm. Well, we have to clean up our house, too. And this is all part of organizational work. If we don't deal with this problem, we are going to lose another generation completely. Now, why isn't the government more alarmed of this situation? I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on out there, but why isn't it that there's not such strong, powerful enforcement in black areas? In fact, we have a situation where, in many cases, it seems like the police are involved. <laughs> Now, this is familiar to me because I come from Jamaica and I know that the police down there, they mix up in it too. You know? You know this how the pattern is the same? Hmm? Always the same. So who is behind all this thing, really? There are forces at work. Forces, as my father would say, opposed to the progress of the African, who are quite happy to have him walking around like a zombie and achieving strange positions in relationship to the horizontal and the vertical. You ever watch a man who is really high and he can take up? And you say, my God, he's going to drop. That was one of the things, you know. When I came here first, I said, amazing how these brothers here can lean. And he said, well, by all the force of gravity, it's supposed to make him drop. He just come right back up again. 
<laughs> that is what a real good fix seems to be able to do to these men that they defy gravity. But what's happening to their minds? What is their productivity? What is their creativity? We have lost a valuable African human being. And we are losing too many of them. We have to call a halt. The next problem is the educational problem. The, our lack of technical skills in a world that is increasingly more technical and sophisticated. And there we must take control of the educational progress, process. There are school boards in our districts where we dominate. We must control the system there. And that calls for organization. Not for party organization, but for black people's grassroots organization. Whenever you organize along traditional political lines, you start playing the party game. And what is, uh, is the basic interest is the interest of the African community. Not in furthering the political ambitions of peoples. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need political effort. But you notice that whatever political effort the Jew is putting in, he always has his own Jewish organizations in place to ensure that his children get a decent education. That he defeats the drug pusher and the, and the drug. Because Jews use drugs too. Everybody uses drugs. It's not confined to a race. But it's the strength of your intrinsic and indigenous institutions that will enable you to, will enable you to defeat these problems. We must control the educational pro process. And we must create our own separate educational institutions that will teach that will teach our, our, our culture, our history, and the peculiar African mindset which we need to develop African power everywhere. You don't become an African nationalist by default. By default, you'll become just another black person walking around the world who has not found himself and doesn't know who he is. And if you don't know who he is, then he certainly won't know where he's going to. Now, I said here, I use the term when I was preparing to talk to you, anti-African attacks. And I would put together here police brutality, murder and harassment of black African people, like the Eleanor Bumpers case, like Michael Griffith, like the four brethren who were shot at like, like birds by Bernard Getz. And I would like also to talk about the misuse of legal process where black people are harassed simply because they make a stand for their rights. Now, you will say that maybe eventually they will get out of it. Eventually they will be acquitted. Do you know ask to anybody to fight your way through the courts for months and months and months? The human sacrifice, the economic sacrifice, the ostracism by your people, because people always say you're guilty of something even when you're not guilty. The minute they bring you up there and put a false charge on you, everybody say you're guilty. And you go through hell to prove it and there's still a lingering doubts in people's minds. And I call this the abuse of legal process, which is used against black people. True. We have had so many cases where black men have gone to prison and years after the truth has come out, but it served 10 years. Mm, you had a case right here in New Jersey. Got the brother away. I don't remember the brother's name. But I had him away for what? Was it the boxer? That's the man, sir. That is a disgusting case. But how do you give a man back 10, 12 years of his life? Now I'm saying that an organization that is nationally united, that has national power, that we have mobilized people all over the world, will have all kind of lawyers to help black people. Just as the Jews and all the other minority groups have all kind of laws that are available. Because all, you see, in other races, people give their time, the, the experts give their time to their people. So they are there on call. No, I mean, they are making tons of money anyhow. So they can give some free service to the black race. We cannot, this can be done through organiz organizational activity. 
when people know and respect their African identity, they will work within African institutions. And they will build institutions that can help black people throughout the world. Now I have to throw some stones. When I went to England and I delivered this bomb, some of people ran out. Now, if I throw the bombs and you run now, I know who you are. <laughs> we must deal with the problem of homosexuality and lesbianism, which is growing on the African race because of our association with the evil ones among whom we live. One of the facts of history is that the African is unique among the races of the world as being so thoroughly heterosexual. Homosexuality has never been a part of African life. Until we were enslaved and brought here among the alien peoples that we developed the tendencies which they have so much among themselves and they have imparted to us. It is disgusting and it is dangerous to see this growth of homosexuality and lesbianism among our people. And when you see black fools walking out there with these faggots talking about gay pride, I see no pride in contradicting nature. It is not a matter of sexual preference. It's a matter of racial destruction. For if we were to take the example that are given by these people who say they are exercising a sexual preference, and all of us were to do were likewise, then the black race would disappear in 20 years. There would be no more after that. And that is serious truth. That tells us that this is wrong. Now we had the Pope come here, and I do not saying that much of what the Pope says. I don't say I agree with him on many things. But imagine the faggots of San Francisco attacking the Pope for expressing the Lord, which is also the law of normal man. God, has, God told us that man should have woman and woman should have man. There is no place in any religion in the world, Buddhist, Confucianist, Hindu, Muslim, Zoroastrianism, Christianity, any kind of religion that you can think of that supports or accepts these noxious practices. And we must be like our ancestors were, severe against this, because this is a disease that we cannot allow to spread among us, just like AIDS. To fight this, we must develop a clear statement of African identity and what it is to be an African. You cannot be a good African and be a faggot. <laughs> you cannot be have African pride and practice perversion, which is too and absolutely an African. <laughs> and I can assure you that I am a member of the UNIA and ACL, and we will not have any faggots in our organization. Yeah. The businesses of black communities are in the hands of aliens in this country. You don't have to look far. Arabs, Koreans, Chinese, Indians, Aryans, and by the term Aryans, I mean the assortment of white people, French, of English, German, the center, whatever they are, and Jews. Everything where you look by that is really worth owning is owned by them. Really worth owning. They have even gone to the lower levels now with this new influx. Newspaper stands and so on. That is the reason why we have a chronic unemployment problem. <coughs> and we can deal with this situation in the ways that I've already indicated. From within strawful African organizations, mobilize our capital, 
and if needs be, bypass the traditional systems of capital formation because they are controlled by people who want us destroyed. They don't want us to survive and let us stop pretending that this is so. All this gimmickry about black businesses and so on is a front business. They set up all these equal opportunity or whatever non and gimmick names. I mean, these companies that you see pretend to be black companies, they are, the blacks are, are the front, but in reality behind it is white interests and white business. Finally, the division of all people must be overcome. Too many middle class blacks, moderate, I would call moderately successful black people, have divorced themselves from the African community and separate themselves into enclaves where they integrate with whites at different levels. And they are not, therefore, available to play their proper leadership role in black communities. The result of this is that we have a permanent black underclass in our society which is not seeing for itself the role models that they should have in order to set them on the right course. <coughs> this underclass is created by the lack of training. It's a problem of education and informal training, but also by the tremendous amount of dropouts that we have in the school system. And all of this is related to the fact that the people who should be leading black people are not there with black people. They are somewhere else playing games in these integrationist ins institutions and social climbing <coughs> instead of dealing with the roots business, the business of black people. What, however you succeed as an African in the world today, you are nothing without the forward movement of the rest of your people. Mm -hmm. Because you can be brought down at a moment's notice. All the same elaborate gains of the middle class can be wiped away overnight by a massive recession. And we'll all the black people out there on the streets together, <laughs> hustling. Of course, those of us who were wearing the three-piece suit and all that, we'll be at a disadvantage when we go out on the streets hustling because we're not accustomed to it. <laughs> I think it is much more appropriate for us to realize the perils that lay ahead of us and as African people to work together for our common good. And this calls for self-reliance and once again organizational and operational unity at all levels. Now I want to look at the, before I let you go, I want to look at the international situation and how Garvism is to be in the, applied internationally. The first question I point I have here is reparations. The African race has never been paid or compensated for slavery. Now, I heard something about so many acres and a mule here. Did you get them? Hmm? You're still waiting. All right. Well, reparations take several forms. First, there is reparations for the work that our ancestors and kinsmen did. Now, when money is owed to you, and it is not paid, that money is calculated at compound interest. When I was in Jamaica in 1972, doing the work of African nationalism in Jamaica, I calculated the amount of money that was owed in 1972 at that time to the black people of Jamaica for just for the slave labor of their ancestors. Now, I won't go into the method of computation, really. Uh, you, I used a, comp a well-known compound interest formula. But essentially, it was based on the average working life of a slave. And also, for the, I used the value of the uh, money that the British government gave to the white slave masters of, of the Caribbean at the time in 1834 when slavery was abolished. About half of that money went to the slave masters of Jamaica, which came up to, at that time, $30 million in 1834. That's what the planters got. So I said, well, I said, well, if we took a generation 
and say the worth of a slave generation was $30 million, then we took the number of generations over slavery, and we said, well, we, that could be an approximation of the worth of the wages that should be given to the slaves at the time in 1834. Then I used compound interest to uh, bring it forward to 1972. The figure I got was just for the island of Jamaica was $558,100 million. Now that was up to 1972. Now as there are many, many more Africans here in the United States uh, than there are in Jamaica, you can imagine how much money is owed to the Africans of the United States just for the slave labor of your ancestors. Now, compensation, that is just one of the factors of compensation. When the Jews get their compensation from Germany, they, of course, put in the work that they did in the slave camps. But you also compensate for the murder of Africans, your Af ancestors and kinsmen. Now, 80 million Africans were butchered or died during the slave trade within those 400 years. Now, how do I arrive at that figure? It's very simple from the mouth of the white man himself. The white man says that around um, 10 to 15 million Africans were successfully transported during the period of slavery over here. Now, I know his line is much more than that, but let's assume 15 million. Then another white man somewhere else said that four to five Africans died for every one that was successfully brought to the United States and to the Brazil and all the other places they brought us. Now, why did we die? Because they set up wars and set up tribes to kill each other. So even before we got to the coast, there was murdering and butchering in order to capture the slaves. Then when they brought you to the coast, they put you in holding pens. You see, because the slave ships don't, are not out there waiting for you. You got to stay in the pens till the slave ship come and they send out so many of you. Now, the condition in the slave pens were atrocious. You see? So you died like flies in the slave pens. Now, when you crossed the Atlantic, it wasn't like today where you fly. They didn't fly, you know. They were packed like sardines in a boat, and they traveled for a very long time. A transatlantic passage it wasn't a matter of two days. When I went to England in 1953, it took us 10 days. I went on a banana boat. It was 10 days. No, that was modern times. So you can imagine how long it took to to, for them to get over here. So they died. Many of them committed suicide or there were rebellions on the ships and they massacred them. Now when they got here now, they had to be conditioned because you have to do something to a free man to make him a slave, you know. And the conditioning is beat his ass, you know, not beat him to kill him, but beat him to break his will. And in the process of breaking his will, you died. You see? So you had all those conditions, that's why four, five to one. Now, when you work it out, 80 million. And it could be more. Very strange, isn't it, that we don't think of our Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But our Holocaust is so huge compared to the Jews. Because I don't tell you anything about the Arab slave trade, you know. Yeah. Because the Arabs were slaving in Africa from, uh, when did they come in here? 643 AD, when the first Arab successfully penetrated into Africa and they never stopped slavery up to 1968, 70. There were still slaves in Saudi Arabia, still African slaves. So they have been enslaving African people over in the east. There they are, so 1,300 years. So they have already taken out, and their slavery, because the Arabs used to be the slave catchers for these Europeans too. You know. So their slavery was at least another 80 million people. That's why we must be a terribly strong race to have survived all those depredations. So the two things that I've given you, the two things, first, payment for wages, then compensation for murder and destruction of our people. Then the next thing, while we were in slavery, we were subject to all manner of human suffering and indignity, which is, I notice, a claim by, you know, the Jews claim, the Japanese now claiming for suffering and human indignity. You see? That's a legal claim, you know. If you do something to some person in the process of doing it, you make him suffer abnormally, and you create, you know, you treat him as if you were an animal, another human being. That in itself is a claim as of right. And finally, when the slaves were brought here, what happened to all the property they had in Africa? Never compensated. 
So that is all property that your ancestors had, and you had to start from scratch after slavery. Yeah. Because that was lost. That's your ancestral property. That's our home over there. Everything that we were left there. Yeah. You took people away who had their farms and land. Now the final thing people say in reparation, well, oh, that is all past, now you can't get it back, no, man. What did the Jews say? The Jews said, no statute of limitation runs against genocide. And I, an African, I'm willing to agree with him. There is no such thing as time passing when genocide is involved. Next is repatriation. The right of every African who wants to return to Africa to return. We want the same right of return that the Jew has to go to Israel. Very important for African people. And, then, and associated with that should be the fact, as an African nationalist, that no warrant, what they call it now, there's a technical legal term for this. You know, like how Joan Chesimard, Asata Shakur, is now in Havana. The extradition. They can't go to Havana to extradite her because Fidel Castro and they were not talking. What I'm saying is that an African reaches his homeland in Africa. There should be a law that forbids extradition to any country, slave trading country, like the United States of America or any Britain or any one of the slave traders to return any African who has reached his homeland here. That is part of the principle of repatriation. If you have the right of return, then you have the right of refuge and safety and sanctuary from your oppressor. The third application of Garvey principles is the creation of African federations. Politically, what we're saying is that we should create f political federations in the Caribbean, in West Africa, in East Africa, and in Central Africa as the precursor to the building of an African super state. The next thing we're saying, we want African centers of high technology. Now I'm reading here from an article I wrote in the City Sun, a progressive New York newspaper. Uh, in, for the August 17th edition, which celebrated the centennial of Marcus Garvey. In that, there I said, African centers of high technology should be established in West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States. These centers should uh, exist apart from the traditional universities and technical colleges. Their purpose should be to do pure and applied research in all topics of scientific and technological endeavor that are on the frontiers of human understanding. These centers should tackle the problems of vital importance to the African involvement and would collect the talents of African people from the whole African world to work on specifically African problems. The next is the creation of an African super state and confederation. The ultimate objective of African unity is the creation of an African super state in the heartland. That's the central portion of Africa, including West Africa, East Africa, and Central Africa. And the development of an African confederation of in independent African countries capable of protecting African people everywhere in the world. This is straight Gavi philosophy coming right out of the philosophy and opinions. Next, we should have Afri African common markets. Common markets should be developed to link the economies of African communities in Africa and in, di and in the di diaspora. Trade between African communities should be carried by African vessels. The operation of aliens in African economies should be restricted to only that which is useful and necessary. The general exploitation of African people by alien merchants and traders should be relentlessly eliminated. Now the next thing I target as necessary for the application of our ideology is the containment and transformation of the Sahara. Now, the, the Sahara is an immense area in Africa, which is desert area, which is creeping south and imperils the life of people throughout Africa. It is the, one of the causes of the great famines that we have had in Africa. Now, the Jew in Israel 
has transformed the desert into arable land. And I'm saying that we as Africans should attack the problem of the Sahara. This menace to Africa must be controlled. An attack on the Sahara requires energy resources and skillful deployment of agricultural techniques in soil and desert reclamation. The Sahara has an immense and widespread energy source, solar radiation. Development of low-cost solar cells to transform the solar energy into a continuous supply of electrical energy during the periods of solar supply would allow the pumping of the massive supplies of water that would be required. In addition, the strong winds of the Sahara, that is the famous Haharmatan, promise another source of clean energy. Now, clean energy is important because we, want, we wouldn't be using atomic energy and have the problems like this white man over here of what to do with atomic waste. So here God has given us two things. This massive sun pouring down energy on the Sahara. The Sahara is always little sun every day. And I'm saying use solar energy cells. That, this is a scientific development that is in its infancy, but Africans should be in this because we are the people who can best apply it in the world. And that's what black scientists should be devoting themselves to. Right. Now, I talk about the next thing, development of African military power. Yeah. And here is what I'm saying, Garvey Doctrine. In a wild beast, the African is too lightly armed. The white man has massive numbers of nuclear weapons. The Chinese have nuclear weapons. The Indians have nuclear weapons. Other nations have them too. The African, in comparison, has no armament industry that produces even efficient machine guns and small rockets. Africans everywhere must develop military power. We must have memorials to the Holocaust. The Holocaust is the destruction of African people that took place during the slave trade, both Western and Eastern. There is not one single memorial to the greatest genocide the world has, the greatest acts of genocide the world has ever known. Nowhere in the world. Yet all over the place there are memorials to the Jewish Holocaust. These millions and millions of Africans that died were not insects or microbes. They were living human beings full of love and passion and feeling. They were our ancestors and kinsmen. It is our sacred duty to remember them and their destruction and to say never, never, never again. Finally, South Africa must be destroyed. <laughs> the Aryan racist regime in South Africa must be destroyed or else it will destroy Africa. This is a holy cause. We need an African holy war to destroy the Aryan beast, the kinsmen of Adolf Hitler and the German Reich utterly. The time is now for an African crusade from every corner of the African world to smite the Aryan races. Black people volunteered in every country during the last world war to fight against Hitler. Here is a cause infinitely more worthy. The situation of the Aryan invader occupying the south of Africa is distressingly similar to that of the Asian invaders of Lower Egypt in 3100 BC. Let us not repeat the mistakes of our ancestors. We must remember the lessons of history. The Red Indians of America, the Aborigines of Australia, and the Moors of New Zealand. Clean them out, Britain and Boer, and send them back to Europe where they belong. I know you have heard me. I just have one more thing to tell you before I close. From page 14 of volume one of the philosophy and opinion. And I want you to bear this in mind as we leave here. All of us may not live to see the higher accomplishment of an African empire, so strong and powerful as to compel the respect of mankind. But we, in our lifetime, can so work and act as to make the dream a possibility within another generation. One God, one aim, one destiny.
Thank you. Thank you very much, sisters and brothers, and please do not leave. We've locked the doors. <laughs> now, this brother has lived in the tradition of his father, and he's brought us a powerful message. Did you get it? Yeah.